My name is Nick and I'm an alcoholic. I'll be doing step one from the 12 and 12. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Admission of powerlessness is the first step in liberation. Relation of humility to sobriety. Mental obsession plus physical allergy. Why must every AA hit bottom? Step one. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. It is truly awful to admit that, glass in hand, we have warped our minds into such an obsession for destructive drinking that only an act of providence can remove it from us. No other kind of bankruptcy is like this one. Alcohol now become, became the rapacious creditor Bleeds, of, bleeds us of all self-sufficiency and all will to resist its demands. Once this stark fact is accepted, our bankruptcy as going human concerns is complete. <clears throat> but upon entering AA, we soon take quite another view of this absolute humiliation. We perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first steps toward liberation and strength. Our admissions of personal powerlessness finally turn out to be firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. We know that little good can come to any alcoholic who joins AA unless he has first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. <clears throat> Until he so humbles himself, his sobriety, if any, will be precarious. If of real happiness, he will find none at all. Prove beyond doubt by any immense experience this is one of the facts of AA life the principle that we shall find no enduring strength until we first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our whole society has sprung and flowered when first challenged to admit defeat most of us revolted we had approached AA expecting to be taught self-confidence then we had been told that so far as alcohol is concerned, self-confidence was no good, whatever. In fact, it was a total liability. <clears throat> Our sponsors declared that we were the victims of a mental obsession so subtly powerful that no amount of human willpower could break it. There was, they said, no such thing as the personal conquest of this compulsion by the unaided will. Relentless need deepening our dilemma. Our sponsors pointed out that our increasing sensitivity to alcohol, an allergy they called it. The tyrant alcohol wielded a double-edged sword over us. First, we were smitten by an insane urge that condemned us to go on <clears throat> drinking, and then by an allergy of the body that ensured we would ultimately destroy ourselves in the process. Few indeed were those who, so assailed, had ever won through in single-handed combat. <clears throat> it was a statistical fact that alcoholics almost never recovered on their own resources, and this had been true, apparently, ever since man had first crushed grapes. In AA's pioneering time, none but the most desperate cases could swallow and digest this unpal unpalatable truth. Even these last gaspers often had difficulty in realizing how hopeless they actually were. But a few did, and when these laid hold of AA principles with all the fervor with which the drowning seas life preservers, they almost invariably got well. <clears throat> this is why the first edition of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, published when our membership was small, dealt with low bottom cases only. Many less desperate alcoholics tried AA but did not succeed because they could not make the admission of hopelessness. It is a tremendous satisfaction to record that in the following years this changed. Alcoholics who still had their health, their families, their jobs, and even two cars in the garage began to recognize their alcoholism. As this trend grew, they were joined by young people who were scarcely more than potential alcoholics. They were spared that last 10 or 15 years of literal hell the rest of us had gone through. Since step one requires an admission that our lives had become unmanageable, how could people such as these take this step? <clears throat> it was obviously necessary to raise the bottom the rest of us had hit to the point where it would hit them. By going back in our own drinking histories, we could show that years before we realized it, 
we were out of control, that our drinking even then was no mere habit, that it was indeed the beginning of a fatal progression. To the doubters we could say, perhaps you're not an alcoholic after all. Why don't you try some more controlled drinking? Hearing in mind, meanwhile, what we have told you about alcoholism. This attitude brought immediate and practical results. It was then discovered that when one alcoholic had planted in the mind of another the true nature of his malady, that person could never be the same again. Following every spree, he would say to himself, maybe those AAs were right. After a few such experiences, often years before the onset of extreme difficulties, he would return to us convinced. He had hit bottom as truly as any of us. John Barleycorn, Barleycorn <clears throat> himself had become our best advocate. Why all this insistence that every AA must hit bottom first? The answer is that few people will sincerely try to practice the AA program unless they have hit bottom. For practicing AA's remaining 11 steps means the adaption of attitudes and actions that almost no alcoholic who is still drinking can dream of taking. Who wishes to be rigorous, rigor, rigorous, rigorously honest and tolerant? Who wants to confess his faults to another and make restitution for harm done? Who cares about anything about a higher power, let alone meditation and prayer? Who wants to sacrifice time and energy in trying to carry AA's message to the next sufferer? No, the average alcoholic, self-centered in the extreme, doesn't care for this prospect unless he has to do these things in order to stay alive himself. Under the lash of alcoholism, we are driven to AA, and there we discover the fatal nature of our situation. Then, and only then, do we become as open-minded to conviction and as willing to listen as the dying can be. We stand ready to do anything which will lift the merciless obsession from us.